The sun has gone down at Hangman's Hill and the ghost at Misery Corner isn't walking tonight. So, welcome to the Weird Tales Radio Show, your weekly fix of ghost stories, urban myths, witchcraft, magic and folklore. And now, here's your host, writer, award-winning journalist, best-selling author and sometime werewolf hunter, Charles Christian. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Weird Tales Radio Show, the home of geek, folklore and paranormal entertainment, with me, Charles Christian, as once again we delve into the worlds of weirdness, urban myths, history, geek culture, ghosts, magic, witchcraft, the occult, anything else I think will intrigue you. This week we have another big interview coming up. We're heading into the realms of witchcraft and folk magic this time. But first we start with not one, but two stories about vampires. We begin in Romania, where health officials have set up a Covid vaccination centre at Bran Castle, the former home of Vlad the Impaler a real-life historical character said to have been the inspiration for Count Dracula in Bram Stoker's novel of the same name. The idea is that while you are visiting the castle, which is a tourist attraction, when you finish looking around the castle's exhibition of 52 medieval torture instruments, presumably one for each week of the year, instead of going straight into the tea rooms and the souvenir shop, you first stop off for a vaccination, administered by doctors and nurses wearing fang stickers on their scrubs. Yes, I know, how times have changed. The original Count Dracula's way of dealing with visitors to his castle was to suck blood from their veins, whereas today you get a vaccine injected into your veins. Let's just hope the needles are a little smaller than the large pointy sticks Vlad the Impaler used on his victims. Now for a forgotten piece of Scottish urban myth. The strange tale of the Gorbals vampire. Now over here in the UK, there are still people banging on about the Highgate vampire incident in 1970, where, thanks to sensationalist newspaper headlines and TV coverage and it was the summer and there was not much happening, a flash mob of vampire hunters stormed the gates of Highgate Cemetery in North London looking for a non-existent vampire. We carried a story about this way back on this show about four years ago. But the Highgate case was only 50 years ago. Let's wind back the clock almost 70 years to the moral panic that was the case of the Gorbals vampire. The best summary can be taken from this story the BBC Scotland News ran about it just over 10 years ago. When PC Alex Deeprose, and you can all rest safe in the knowledge that PC Alex Deeprose does not meet the same fate of Sergeant Howie, the hapless police officer in the Wicker Man movie, when PC Deeprose was called to Glasgow's sprawling southern necropolis, on the evening of the 23rd of September 1954, he expected to be dealing with a simple case of vandalism. But the bizarre sight that awaited him was to make headlines around the world and cause a moral panic that led to the introduction of strict new censorship laws in the UK. Hundreds of children aged from 4 to 14, some of them armed with knives and sharpened sticks, were patrolling inside the historic graveyard. They were, they told Constable Deeprose, hunting a seven-foot-tall vampire with iron teeth who had already kidnapped and eaten two local boys. Fear of the so-called Gorbals vampire had spread to many of their parents who begged PC Deeprose for assurances there was no truth to the rumours. Newspapers at the time reported that the headmaster of a nearby primary school told everyone present that the tale was ridiculous and that they should all go home and police were finally able to disperse the crowd. But the armed mob of child vampire hunters was to return immediately after sunset the following night and the night after that. Now, 
there were no records of any missing children in Glasgow at the time and media reports of the incident began to search for the origins of the story that gripped the city. The blame was quickly laid at the door of American comic books. Uh, these were just starting to be imported into the UK in the early 1950s. Uh, comic books with chilling titles such as Tales from the Crypt and the Vault of Horror, whose graphic images of terrifying monsters were becoming increasingly popular among youngsters all over the UK, including Scotland. These comics, so the theory went, were corrupting the imagination of children and inflaming them with fear of the unknown. A government of the day responded to the clamour by introducing the Children and Young Persons Harmful Publications Act of 1955, which for the first time specifically banned the sale of magazines and comics portraying incidents of a repulsive or horrible nature to minors. Presumably, this would also ban the sale of newspapers uh, carrying reports of the activities of government ministers and politicians. But I digress. And uh, older listeners may recall there was a similar moral panic on both sides of the Atlantic in around 1962, following the release of the Mars attack bubblegum cards. They were particularly graphic and obviously went on to make their appearance in the movie. So what was the inspiration for the story of the vampire with the iron teeth? Well, there was an issue of a comic. The comic was called Dark Mysteries, and issue 15, published in 1953. Uh, the artist was a character called Hai Fleischmann. He wrote a story called The Vampire with Iron Teeth really was called that. Uh, you can see the find the uh, full details of this on Steve Bain's The Horror of It All blog. Uh, you'll find the full link to the blog on the website. Now, by modern standards, the story hasn't stood the test of time and really doesn't make a lot of sense. Basically, it's about a cursed set of false teeth that are made of iron. Yeah, but just like Slenderman and other urban myths... The vampire with the iron teeth took on a life of its own. Time for this week's guest, and it's my great pleasure to introduce Val Thomas, a Norfolk-based herbalist, witch, craftsperson, author and teacher. Her books include A Witch's Kitchen and Of Chalk and Flint, A Way of Norfolk Magic the latter being dedicated to the nameless tradition and eldritch world of East Anglia. And the interview, it should be added, took place at Val's home, a little cottage filled with plants, herbs, books, magical paraphernalia and black cats. It's my great pleasure to be talking to Val Thomas, the notional topic is her book of Chalk and Flint, A Way of Norfolk Magic, which was a book that came out in November 2019. And we were trying to get an interview, but of course, the pandemic got in the way. So um, 18 months later, here we are and about to talk to you. Lovely to talk to you and, and lovely to meet you at last after all this time. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we've been virtual friends on social media. <laughs> Indeed. So it's nice to meet finally. Yes. Now, tell me about the book. What was the inspiration for it? Well, I suppose it was 25 years of living in this house in Norwich and doing magical work with various people, various different groups, um, work which is very much rooted in the land and the landscape of Norfolk um, and, and working with the gods and the spirits that are special to this area. Um, so, so after all of those years, I felt that I wanted to write the book almost as a tribute to the county of Norfolk and to its magic and to all of the beings, human and uh, creatures, 
plants, trees and spirits uh, who make up part of this amazing and, and magical tapestry of the landscape in which we live. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people possibly don't realise that whereas Norfolk now is very much a bit of a, a rural, uh, out-of-the-way place that you pass heading north, it was one of the earliest places where England really started. Um, the Romans were here, it was the Iceni before that, and back in the Middle Ages with wool, it was one of the wealthiest counties. I think Norwich was the second city in England, wasn't it? So I it, believe it was, yes. And, yeah. of, and of course, you know, the wool trade was very important here and we can still see traces of all that, that wealth and prosperity and, and the importance of the area um, in, for example, the, the Flint churches that are such a feature of the landscape. Yes, and uh, with the round towers as well. Yes, and they're so beautiful and so special to see and, and it's wonderful to think that, that they've stood there for so long and for so many generations. Yeah. Part of the title is of Chalk and Flint. Now, Flint's obvious because, as you've just mentioned, all the Flint churches and um, it's a standing joke among anybody who's got land or farmers that the land just appears to be solid flint and however much you remove it, you still plough up more and more of it. What's the chalk aspect? Because we don't tend to associate Norfolk. You tend to think, you know, the White Cliffs of Dover and chalk and things. What's, what's the chalk aspect? Well, it's a very important part of the geology of the county and uh, one one of the best ways to appreciate the importance of the chalk is to stand on the beach at somewhere like West Runton and watch the tide recede and then you can see just a little bit of the chalk reef which is off the North Norfolk coast and, and as, as the waves go back there you can see the chalk and it is as if the lady of the chalk, the white lady the goddess who is the mother of the flint is stepping out of the sea onto the land as she does twice a day. Mm. Twice a day, every day, 365 yes. days a year for thousands and thousands of years. It's an amazing thought, isn't it? And she's always different when she comes out. You know, sometimes she's she's almost pure white, and and sometimes. She's, she's green, you know, covered in a, a cloak of seaweed. So she's never the same twice. So it's always exciting to stand there and watch because you never quite know what form she's going to appear in. Mm -hmm. um, tell us about some of the... Because um, you have a, a chapter on it in the book on the sacred places and the stories within the landscape. I mean... Again, people will say, well, there's Walsingham, that was um, an early Marian shrine, but there's plenty of other places that far predate Christianity, don't they? Yes, absolutely. Um, some of the places that I mention in the book are, are, are woodlands because we are lucky enough to have some ancient woodland still left in the county. One of my favourites is Wayland Wood in uh, mid-Norfolk, uh, very near to Watton. Uh, and of course, that's the place which is famous for the story of the babes in the wood mm -hmm. who um, were the heirs to uh, a fortune, uh, but unfortunately their wicked stepfather wanted to take their inheritance for himself, so had foresters take them out and he, they were supposed to, to murder the children, but in fact they just left them in the woods. And of course, you know, we, we all know the story of how the birds came and covered them with leaves. Um, and uh, you know, that's such an important story and, and such a feat of the wood and indeed that story is featured on the uh, village sign in Watton mm. and uh, you know sadly the babes died in that wood but 
nevertheless, Wayland has a, a, a wonderful feel to it. It's a, a very magical place and you can absolutely feel the sacredness of it there. And of course, it has some wonderful plants. You know, it's got various different types of orchids, um, lots of stitchwort and bird cherries. It's very special because it's one of the most southerly places where the bird cherry trees grow naturally. You do find them planted much further south in England, but uh, but Wayland, they they, uh, yeah. they have been there for a very long time. And of course, they bring with them, you know, some of the magic of more northerly places because they, they grow magnificently in Russia and Scandinavia. Uh, and, and there we have them in Norfolk. And, and when they're in bloom, the scent of them is just amazing. And the name Wayland, I mean, I know a lot of people say... It's from Wailing Wood and it was the children wailing in the woods that the name came from. But Wayland is an old Norse god, isn't he? Yes, he, he, was, he, he was a divine smith, uh, one who um, has, you know, has, has an important story of his own. And, uh, and of course, you know, divine smiths of all kinds throughout the world are very important um, mythologically and magically. So it's possible that, that that name may also be a reference to him. But I, but I often think, you know, you don't have to say that it's, it's one meaning or another meaning. You, you, you can actually have both meanings at the same mm. time because, you know, th there are resonances that, that go together in places and uh, yes. things are often more, you know, it's more subtle than just saying it must be either this or this. Yeah. It can be both. So, yes, I, I, I think of it both as, as, as the wailing wood, as a reference to the sadness of the children who died there uh, or, or to the divine smith. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, historically, it does seem that there was a wicked uncle who did away with his nephew or nieces, and at there, you know, in the Elizabethan times, there there are tales of it historically. So it's not one of those sort of fairy tales. There actually is a a root of historical origin in there. I always find intriguing with a lot of folklore that scratch the surface and beneath the, if you like, the fairy story, there's an element of truth there. Yes, absolutely. There, 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 there was a family uh, and that was supposed, supposed to have happened uh, in, in fact. Um, and the story that was written about it was written down... Uh, in the 16th century, I mm. think. So it's, it does go back quite a long way. But yeah. yes, yes, based on a real incident. Yeah. yeah. And another wood, one I've never actually got round to visiting because it's just that bit further away, is Foxley. And I believe that is one of the few bits of ancient forest in left in England or certainly in Norfolk. Yes, it is. It's a very important piece of woodland and uh, and a wonderful place to wander around. It's, it's absolutely beautiful. You know, there, there are traces of old industrial use there, um, but uh, it has you know, the most amaz amazing kind of magic. It, it would probably have been busier in the past yes. than it is now. Um, but nevertheless, there are still lots of really interesting trees, unusual trees still there as well, like the wild service tree, for example. And there are lots of Gelder rose trees too, um, which is a herbalist I tend to think of as cramp bark because it's it's an important medicine, right. um, you know, as a, a, as an antispasmodic, um, and it has one. So the cramp is from the cramps. Yes, as, exactly. As yeah, to yeah. Something on the bark. Yeah. Mm, mm. Yes, but it, it's named for what it treats, um, mm -hmm. and. Uh, there are lots of them. You, you you don't often see lots of of Gelder rose trees together, but but there there are there are plenty of them. And and in the autumn they're covered in these beautiful translucent red berries. They're they're lovely trees. 
Mm. Where else would you pick as particular places to look at? Uh, one of my favourites is Warham Camp, which is uh, it's it's uh, between the villages of Warham and Whiton, and that's uh, an old uh, Romano-British fort, and it's a fantastic circle of uh, earthworks that are, that are that are still there, and and almost the whole circle is there, so you can go in and walk all the way round the top of it. And you can look across the centre, and again, it's it's full of wildflowers as well as echoes of uh, the people who must have lived there in the past. Very peaceful most of the time, but sometimes if you sit there and and listen really carefully, you know, you you can you can hear the voices of people who were once there. Mm-hmm. What about stones? I mean. We don't have any standing stones or at any spectacular Stonehenge-like standing stones circles. There's a few henges, aren't there, um, that have they were wood-based. There's one not far from here, isn't there? Arming Hall. Yes, that's right. Arming Hall Henge is um, is is not far off the the Trous Bypass, in fact, and. That that was an ancient wood henge, though you you can't actually see anything now of the the henge itself. You you can just get an impression of the circle where the posts must have been, and of course that that it was uh, it was discovered um, from the air because mm-hmm. it, you you get a better view when when you're above it of the of the circle and and where the where the posts stood. Um, there are people who like to go there and uh, do magical work, magical rituals. Um, it, personally, it, it doesn't appeal to me because uh, there's an electricity substation now right beside it, and uh, <laughs> and and I find I find that a bit distracting, yes. um, you know, when trying to do magical work. So I like to visit it and see it, but um, but but for actually working magically, I prefer different places. Yes. In your book, you mentioned some of the smaller stones, if you like, marker stones. Um, The Stockton stone is one of them. Uh, Tell us about the stones. Yes, well, most of those stones are glacial erratic, so so they've just been left here um, after the uh, glaciers receded. Uh, and the Stockton Stone, which you mention, is is a lovely one. It's uh, it's actually on the road between um, Norwich and Ludham, mm. and if you're going from Norwich, uh, then you it's it's just on the right hand side uh, as you come to the turn off for the village to Stockton, and it, and it and it's just there. On the verge, uh, and there's a lay-by right beside it, so you can park quite easily and get out and and, and have a look at the stone. Um, it's hard to spot it uh, in the summer because quite often the the, the nettles and the long grass it uh, covers it, but in the winter you can see it really clearly from the road, and. It was once in a different position, but when that road was built. Um, it had to be moved. And of course, as is so often the case with these stones, um, there was a taboo about moving it. And it was said that, that if, if anybody moved it, um, you know, they would die and various other dire things would happen. Um, and I think uh, probably the people who were um, employed to move it were not very happy about it. And, and, and I believe some of them yeah, didn't live very long after having done that. So Yeah, I believe one of the workmen um, collapsed and died trying to move it. But obviously you don't know whether that was a heart attack or what, but... It certainly adds to the mystique of it, doesn't it? It certainly does, yes. Um, and, and it's interesting that you know, quite a lot of the stones uh, around Norfolk, these glacial erratics, you know, they do have that same kind of taboo. Uh, for example, the Merton Stone in uh, mid-Norfolk, not very far from Wayland Wood, actually, uh, it's 
been said that if that is ever moved, then then the waters will gush out and and flood the entire earth. So that that is quite a dramatic one. Yes. Um, though though I have heard a story that uh, that, that uh, a previous Lord Walsingham tried to have the stone moved, and he he got all of his uh, uh, his workers out there to move it, and and they made great efforts but couldn't move it at all because it is very very large um and uh and and it ended up with a kind of drunken revel and uh, <laughs> the stone never got moved so it's remained in its place and so so the county hasn't been flooded which is uh, <laughs> which is all to the good but yes. uh yes but the but the merton stone is it's a it's a very special one i i do like to to go and visit that uh, uh, regularly and of course it's said that uh, if a lady wishes to become pregnant she should go and sit on the Merton stone <laughs> and I do actually know people who have tried that and had some success with the procedure well that's an interesting tip <laughs> <laughs> yes don't bother seeing your gynaecologist <laughs> head yes. off to the Merton stone yeah yes I mean that's one of those that follows quite a lot of stones that there's a ritual associated with it. There's one in the churchyard in Bungie called the Druid Stone, which is very unprepossessing these days. But that has the story that if you walk around it 12 times, you will hear the name of your loved one or something will whatever the particular one you'll either hear the loved one or you'll hear fairies or you'll hear the devil or one of those yes absolutely i mean you know, a lot of them do have those those kind of associations don't they i mean another one you know like that is 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 the great stone of ling of course you know you if if you go there people people say that um you know you will you will hear the voices of the people who fell in battle uh, mm. with King Edmund uh, in that area, and I, I do tell the story in the book actually that uh, you know I, I know of somebody who thought that it would be a great magical thing to do to go and camp the night at the uh, Great Stone of Ling, and he set up a tent in the woodland there um, but during the course of the night he became so frightened that he did actually have to leave the wood and phone somebody to come and rescue him which is uh, quite interesting so I so uh, you know it's a lovely place to visit during the day but uh, mm. you know there, there's there's a lot of kind of you know darker forces associated with it at night and of course, the children who were at school in the area, it used to be the case that they were allowed to leave a little bit earlier from class in order to walk home in daylight during the winter. So they didn't have to walk past the uh, Great really? Stone. Yes, yes. Um, my, my good friend Rod Chapman told me about that, that, uh, that yes, the children were not expected to walk past there in the dark. So if that was their route home, they were allowed to leave school a little earlier. That's, that's fascinating, that. And, and, I mean, it's intriguing, again, that something that sounds like a fairy tale, oh, that's a spooky stone, it was taken sufficiently seriously that an institution, the, church, the, 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 the school, um, made an exception for it. But again, it, it, yeah. it, it sort of emphasizes it yeah it? indeed you know it is it is quite remarkable and, and and it and it shows that people people did then and i and i think you know many people still do respect those aspects of the uh, of of the landscape that we don't you know really thoroughly understand mm. any other places you'd recommend if you were doing a magical tour of norfolk uh another one of my favorites is um is in East Somerton, the, the Witch's Leg, oh, which is a yes. wonderful place, isn't it? Uh, have you been there? Yes. Yeah, so, I, I mean, that's an old ruined church. There, there is another church in Somerton which is now used, but, but this one is ruined. And the story goes that uh, there was a witch in Somerton who had a wooden leg, and somehow she managed to make herself unpopular. So the villagers, in order to kill her uh, and be rid of her, they 
buried her uh, inside the church. Uh, but in order to get her revenge, the witch kicked up her wooden leg, which turned into an oak tree and destroyed the church, which is, is now a ruin mm. um, and, and is covered in ivy and looks, you know, it looks like something from, from a, a horror movie film set. In mm. fact, it's, it's a wonderful place. But, but interestingly, you mentioned about walking round the druid stone in Bungie a certain number of times but if you walk round the oak tree in the middle of the church there uh, and uh, and call on the witch you you can if you walk around three times you can you can get the spirit of the witch to be released and advise you oh right <laughs> advise you not to do that again <laughs> yes probably <laughs> Well, I don't know. We have sometimes tried it. We have a little rhyme that we say. I think it goes round and round the witch's tree, set the witch's spirit free. And, uh, and and then you can ask her for some advice. But of course, you know, she she is a rather dark character. So, mm. uh, um, yes, perhaps not. Uh, yes. Not for the fluffier end of magic. <laughs> I like that fluffier end. You're listening to the Weird Tales radio show with Charles Christian. You mention in the very introduction of the book where you're acknowledging various people who've influenced you over the years, uh, like Nigel Pennick, you talk about the nameless tradition. Tell me more about that. Is that sort of, if you like, the Norfolk name for magic and witchcraft to sort of distinguish it from Wicca, which is now almost a religion. Yes, I mean, the, the, the nameless art is, yeah, is, so. a, is a, a phrase very often used for the, for the kind of traditional witchcraft, which is very much connected with the land. Um, and uh, it, it's it's being used more and more. Nigel Pennick uses the uses the, the phrase "the nameless art" in 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 his books, uh, and uh, also I, I call the work or the, the the tradition that we've kind of been building up uh, over the years the nameless tradition because you know it's not. Um, it's not a strict and hierarchical tradition. It, you know, we we don't have any kind of definite structure. You know, people people meet and work together, um, maybe once. You know, maybe many times, maybe for many many years. But but there's a kind of fluidity about it. So it's not just you know a group and we always do things this way or we we always call on a particular god and goddess. I mean, you know, the the Lord and Lady of Norfolk, who are the Lord of the Flint and the Lady of the Chalk, the the Grey and the White Lady. You know, that they are always part of what we do. Um, but uh, but. You know they're not jealous gods, and mm. so we do work with with other deities as well. And uh, and there's just a, a there's just a kind of fluidity about it, and and a nameless tradition seems the best way to kind of explain that. And as you say, of course, you know I I've been very much influenced by the work of Nigel Pennick, so uh, certainly that's uh, yeah. you know, an important aspect of it all. Yeah. Now, one of the other aspects in your book is you um, talk about the spiritual beings and in particular the fae or fairy folk, depending on how you want to describe them. And I think you say that Foxley Wood is a particular haunt of theirs. Tell us a bit more about that, because I say there's a, there's a huge interest these days in the fae. People are just fascinated by them. Well, yes, and I, I think part of that fascination is because, you know, they are so varied. Um, you know, you, you've, you, you've got the smaller kind of um, fey beings, like the hikey sprites. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're almost little twig-like figures, um, and of course, you know, for, for people who want to know more about that, Ray Loveday's book *Hikey Sprites* is uh, is a wonderful uh, starting point. Um, and throughout Norfolk, older people um, have been aware of their existence, and they were often used as a threat to children. You know, you mm. must behave yourself, or the hikey sprites will get you. 
But other people, you know, have a more favourable view of them. And, and you know, they're, they're dotted around everywhere in the trees because, you know, that's where they can um, camouflage themselves very well. So, so there are certainly a lot of, of that kind of fae being uh, in, in Foxley Wood and indeed in Wayland Wood as well. There are plenty there too. But then there's another kind of uh, being called a, a yallery brown, who, as you might expect from the name, is is a yellow. Yet they wear yellowish brown um, clothing. And uh, my friends, the hermits of Mole End, they actually had a yallery brown that lived in their garden, who they could watch through the window. They never made contact with this being. Um, but he was definitely there. And Yallery Browns are the subjects of various stories. You know, very often uh, they offer people gold and then it turns out to be fairy gold, which is just mm. the, the autumn leaves. Mm. Um, yeah, so, so they appear in lots of stories. And then there are um, the other beings called the strangers or the green coaties, Um and these are beings that can be very helpful to people. They can, you know, they can help look after your home and your land, but you have to respect them. And there's a there's a wonderful story which is called the Stranger's Share about people's relationship with these beings in the past and how they always went out and offered the first fruits of everything that they'd grown to the strangers they placed it on flat stones uh, as an offering um, but as years went by people began to forget to do that and so they destroyed their relationship with the strangers by not showing them the respect that was due to them and as a result there was a lot of sickness and uh, famine and, and, and poverty and it was only after things had gone, as the story says, terribly arsey versy, <laughs> that uh, that people realised their mistake and 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 began to leave out the offerings again and uh, yeah, and, and to heal their relationship with the strangers. So. Uh, you know, I, one of the things that I personally do is on a regular basis, I leave out offerings to the strangers in my garden, uh, just to be sure that uh, that I, I keep them happy. Yeah. Do you think we are living through a resurgence in interest in the Fae, to use it as a general term, and that, you know, it's, they, seem, they seem to fall out of favour, I suppose, when the 20th century came along and the First World War and suddenly things were rather, rather horrible and the sort of halcyon rem remembered days of the Edwardian era had all faded away and everything was grim. Do you think we are seeing a resurgence of interest, uh, you know, generally, as opposed to just among, if you like, enthusiasts like yourself? Yes, I think so. That a lot of people express that, you know, through through artwork and story and, you know, Norfolk has some very, very good storytellers, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. So, you know, and, uh, and, and some of them have, have told stories about the fair folk and, uh, in fact, one of the, one, one of the nicest, uh, writings by a storyteller about about the fairies is, is Hugh Lupton who's written a book of Norfolk mm. folk tales and he's an excellent storyteller as well and so so I think yes that through stories through art through books it, they are very important and they do appeal to people um, you know perhaps it's something to do with you know the loss of places in the natural world and you know mm. our need for that and and also our need to heal our relationship with the natural world and, and perhaps with some of its beings. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things that I've noticed, it's just a, a personal observation, is that fairy activity often seems to occur in places that have been uh, industrialised or built upon but have gone back to being, um, well, if not natural... 
at mm. least uh, places which have a wealth of, of wildlife and, mm. and now appear natural. I mean, one that uh, that I would mention is uh, is Alderford Common, uh, just uh, just this side of Reefham, and and that's amazing. And that that was an ancient industrial site, but mm. now. If you want to see fairies, it's a great place to go. Mm. And just in the city as well, you know, Carey's Meadow, that uh, that has been a, even a rubbish dump and uh, yeah. and is now, you know, it's it's full of magical activity, especially if you go there at twilight. It's, it's a lovely place yeah. and right in the centre of the city. Yeah, yeah. Whereabouts is that? Yeah, it's on Thorpe Road, mm -hmm. uh, just opposite the... Um, it's just opposite the entrance, where Harvey Lane comes down right. to uh, to Thorpe Road. So it's uh, yeah, yeah. So it's so it's pretty central, really. Mm, mm, mm. Again, you were mentioning former industrial sites, um, presumably places like Foxley Wood, which we've referred to. It would have been charcoal burners and the likes, wouldn't it? Absolutely, yes. Uh, lots of lots of charcoal burners in in Foxley, certainly. Yeah. And turning to you and your writing activities, what's next on the agenda? Well, during the lockdown, I kept a diary of all the magical work that I did. And it's a kind of a mixture of what was happening and my thoughts about it at the time and the magic that we were doing and... Uh, I really just kept it as a record for myself initially, but uh, looking back at it, it's it's now about a hundred and fifty thousand words. It's quite a, <laughs> there's quite a lot of it, yeah. and uh, so I'm going back through it now and and sort of editing it a bit. And um, Troy Books, who were the publisher of of Chalk and Flint, uh, have said that they might be interested in looking at it and, and possibly publishing it. So uh, I, I, need to, I need to go back through it and, and assess it. But that's, that's what I did. I kept this diary during the lockdown and, uh, and, and I almost used it as a way of, uh, you know, keeping, um, well, having the freedom of being out in the world you know, just by thinking back to things that had happened in the past, thinking about all the places that I was familiar with and that uh, that it wasn't possible to go to because, you know, all the car parks were closed. People were actually stopping you going there. So, you know, mm. it, it, it wasn't it wasn't really feasible to go there at all. Um, you know, but but uh, one of the things about having a, a fertile imagination is that uh, that you can visit those kind of places even without being there physically. Um, and one of the things that we like to do is to, when we are at these sort of places, is, is to make what we call sprawl boxes, which takes the energy of the place by just taking a, a you know a pebble or a leaf or a, a pine cone or a little piece of bone, whatever you find at that place, and keeping it in a box. And I've got several of them that I've had for years from some of my favourite places. So during lockdown, I was opening these boxes and thinking about all those places and uh, and feeling their magic even when I couldn't visit them. So yes, so 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 maybe that is my my next mm. uh, writing project to to actually you know put this diary into a suitable format for publication. Mm. Tell us more about the sprout boxes. Then is it just any box or? Is there do you do you, you craft a box or you find a special box or what? Uh, well, crafting a box would be absolutely the best way to do it um, because you know the the, the more uh, of your own energy and effort that you put into your magical items, the better really. Um, However, in the case of boxes, I'm not personally very good at straight lines. Um, <laughs> so making the box itself is 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 not uh, not something that uh, that I'd be particularly good at. So what I tend to do is um, is is buy a cheap wooden box and and sand it all down, and then I decorate it with pyrography and write the name of the place in pyrography on the box, and then I fill it with. Uh, all the all the lovely things from that place. Yeah, pyrography. That would be what 
what we used to call poker work, would it? Yes, yes. Yeah. Just uh, you, can, you can. I just use a, a very simple soldering iron, yeah. and you can then burn patterns into the wood yeah. quite easily. So yeah, it's yeah. a nice, yes. simple way to decorate things. Yes. What else? How is the nameless art, the nameless tradition, in terms of health in the Norfolk, Norwich area? Is it hanging on by its fingernails or is there a sizable community? Oh, there's there, there's a there's a very sizable community now. Um, when we when we do our big public rituals, they are hugely popular. Um, we normally do one for Twelfth Night on Mousehole Teeth. We we have um, we have a being called the Ikeni, who's uh, who is an os. So so it's a, it's a horse's mm-hmm. skull on a pole with a cloak, and uh, and and somebody is inside that, uh, which is sometimes referred to as riding the os. So 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 the Ikeni comes out on these kind of public occasions, and. Um, you know, we can we can get you know fifty people coming to a ritual like that. So so these things do attract quite uh, mm. a, a, a big well, I say audience, but it's not really an audience because we always make sure that everybody participates. Yeah. You know, and everyone has a, a has an active involvement in the ritual. So so for for public rituals, we get a lot of people, um, but we also have uh, various moots in the county, which are meetings of. Of people who are interested in in this kind of thing, uh, Norwich Moot. Uh, we in the past we met at the Silver Rooms on Silver Road, and hopefully we will again once that's everything is opened up and we're allowed to continue with that. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know we regularly get um, twenty. 20 30 people there sometimes more uh, to a talk but as i say you know if we if we put on a ritual that does attract more people because mm-hmm. people do seem to have a great appetite for mm. uh, for ritual work for some reason uh, there's also a coffee moot there's a group of people who like to meet at the forum in the center of norwich uh, on a, on a saturday morning to just have a coffee and discuss you know, magical and folklore type things and um now of course because of lockdown we we have an online mm. moot and you know, we've had a huge number of people come to that sometimes and uh we now attract an international audience, so so we've yeah. got we've got people who are sort of nominally members of Norwich Moot from the USA and Canada and Australia. So it's you know yeah, it's got quite a, a large reach. So I'd say it's a very healthy community, and and the people who actually live here, you know, are very supportive of each other. In fact, you know, yeah. there's uh, you know there's a lot of really strong friendships which have lasted for many many years yeah um and of course norwich moot is possibly one of the oldest of of the moots in the country um i started going to the moot in the early 1990s Mm -hmm. when it was run by um a man called Eric Winch, who was he was a Wiccan and a member of the Fellowship of Isis, and you know he was he was a very uh, experienced and an important figure within the craft. Um, but whether he had actually started it himself or whether somebody had started mm. it before him, I don't know. So it might even you know go back to the nineteen eighties or even earlier possibly. Mm. So it's mm. it's been around a long time, and yeah. uh, and as I say, you know there are lots of friendships that have lasted over decades mm. um, associated with the moot, and and it is it it it's a good community. Yeah. What about the demographic? Are you getting younger people joining? Uh, yeah, there are there are plenty of younger people that you know. There are of course you know quite a lot of us oldies, but uh, yeah, there are still younger people who join. We've 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 got yeah we've got people in their twenties, people in their uh, mm-hmm. you know people in their thirties. Um, have we got anybody younger than twenty? I can't actually think of anybody at the moment, but yeah. but but possibly. But yeah, I mean yeah. we we yeah. do attack we do attract a good age range. Yeah. I would say yeah yeah. And if people want to 
find out more about the Norwich moot on Zoom? Where would they look or how would they find it? Yeah, the Norwich moot has uh, has a website mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yes, yeah, so and, and it also has a Facebook page. Right. Um, and it's also on Instagram, Norwich Pagan Moot on Instagram as well. So, we, so we've got quite a good kind of online presence where people can find right. information. Yeah. So Norwich Pagan Moot, as a, yes, w would be the way you'd find it. Yes. Yeah, those, yeah, those words yeah. with the pagan bit. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Right. One final question. What was your favourite part when it came to writing the latest book what was the bit you enjoyed the most oh that's a really difficult question <laughs> um what did i enjoy the most oh goodness me I've... what bit did you get really excited about writing i think uh possibly the opening chapter about the Lord and Lady of Norfolk. I, I, I that it's the opening chapter, but I didn't write it first. I wrote mm. that quite uh, late on mm. uh, during the process. But that really felt like you know the the the, the kind of tribute to these uh, these great deities that have been part of the landscape, you know, ev ever ever since uh, well. Ever since time began, probably, mm, mm. And, and so that was that was very important. And thinking back to some of the incidents that um, that I mentioned, you know, where you feel that sense of blessing from them was was lovely. Yeah. So I suppose if I had to pick one bit, it, it would be it would be that that chapter about them. Well, Val, thank you ever so much for your time. That was lovely. Thank you, Charles. Thank you very much. It's been lovely to meet you and to, to talk to you this morning. Once again, a big thank you to this week's guest, Val Thomas. We'll have a full list of website and social media links, as well as a link to a video she made to promote the book of Chalk and Flint in the podcast metadata, on our Weird Tales Show YouTube channel, and on the urbanfantasist.com website. However, here are a few links to start with. www.valthomaswitch.co.uk You can also follow Val on Instagram at valthomaswitch. And finally, the Norwich Pagan Moot she mentions can be found at www.norwichmoot.co.uk And apologies if you hear our hound from hell yapping in the background. If you look on the urbanfantasist.com website, you'll see this week we've got a photo of a keyboard embedded in concrete on a street. So what's the story? Well, the location is between Princes Street and Elm Hill in the city of Norwich. And it is, uh, to all intents and purposes, the imprint of a keyboard. Uh, in fact, it's an old Amstrad PC keyboard. Needless to say, a number of urban myths have surrounded its creation, the most popular one being that it fell off the back of a lorry into some wet cement, which, when you think about it, wouldn't be possible as the imprint would be in the inverse, as opposed to this way it looks like an actual concrete keyboard. The truth, it turns out, was that it's all the work of an art student at the what's now the Norwich University of the Arts, a student called Molly Soule, who was studying there in the 1990s. And part as part of a project, she made a mould of an old computer keyboard and created various porcelain casts that then were bent into strange shapes. This created the illusion of the keyboards being washed, dried and hung on a laundry line. The actual keyboard imprint came into existence one day when Sol was on her way to college and um, she passed by a patch of wet cement 
and it was just too tempting, so she took out her mould, pressed it into the concrete, creating the iconic imprint. And it's nice to see that, despite the fact that the pavement has been recently redone with tarmac, the keyboard continues to remain visible. Definitely worth a little wander around there if you are ever in Norwich. It's just by St Andrew's Halls. Before we go, time for one last story. Now, for some of us of a certain age, we still have fond memories of the 1966 adventure movie One Million Years BC, especially the bits involving Raquel Welch, a.k.a. Loana the Fair One, in a fur bikini battling fearsome dinosaurs. Yes, and I do know that the last dinosaurs became extinct about 60 million years ago and that modern humans did not appear on the scene until about 300,000 years ago. So the events in the movie could never have possibly occurred. There again, as Ray Harryhausen, who animated all the dinosaur scenes using stop-motion animation, commented in a subsequent interview several years ago, he didn't make one million years BC for professors who probably don't go to see these kinds of movies anyway. Fair cop. But wait, what's this? A report from Spain earlier this year that a man was found dead inside the belly of a dinosaur. OK, it was a life-size fibreglass statue of a stegosaurus that had been used as a promotional stunt for a local cinema in a town near Barcelona. Would have been rather cool if it turned out it was a stunt for showing of one million years BC. Anyway, what happened is a passerby noticed an unpleasant smell emanating from the dinosaur and, taking a closer look through a crack in one of the creature's legs, he could see the decomposing body of a man. Naturally, he contacted the emergency services and a police investigation subsequently ascertained that the victim had accidentally dropped his cell phone inside the dinosaur, possibly while taking a selfie, and had then climbed inside the statue to retrieve it. Unfortunately, he went in headfirst and got stuck. Both the victim and the dinosaur have now been permanently removed. Now, it just remains for me to say, this is Charles Christian saying, thank you so much for listening in. Please join me again next time for more Strange Tales for Strange Times. Until then, stay well, stay weird. Goodbye. Black Shuck, the demon dog of East Anglia is baying at the moon. Which means it's time for us to go. You've been listening to the Weird Tales radio show with Charles Christian, your weekly fix of ghost stories, urban myths, witchcraft, folklore, and the paranormal. You can keep in touch with us online at www.urbanfantasist.com, by email to urbanfantasist at icloud.com, and on Twitter at Urban Fantasist. Join us again next week for another edition of the Weird Tales radio show. Goodbye.